Picture this, it's the year 2000. You're glued to your TV, constantly watching reruns of your favorite shows. Now, there are a lot of great options, but your favorite is Spider-Man. From the moment you hear that iconic theme song for the very first time, you were absolutely hooked. Spidey became your guy. You watch every single episode over and over again, desperate to get every crumb of the wall crawler as possible. And once you've exhausted every episode and even watched all of Spider-Man Unlimited, you're suddenly on the hunt for even more. Apparently there's a film on the way, but you can't wait that long. You need Spider-Man and you need it now. And then on one fateful day, someone casually mentions these things called comic books, where every month you get brand new Spider-Man adventures. And not only that, but there are already 40 years worth of Peter Parker stories to run through. Your mind is immediately blown, and what do you do? You scrape together your pocket money and rush out to your local newsagents to try and track down one of these comics yourself. You manage to find some and you pick up an issue, race home and read it. You read it over and over, and you're forever changed by it. It's the spider you know, but different. It feels new, modern, somehow fresh yet familiar. You stare at the front cover, reading the title, Ultimate. Spider-Man. It's no secret that over the past few years on the channel, I've covered a lot of Marvel's Ultimate Universe. Beginning in the new millennium, this alternate imprint to the company's long-standing continuity is something that's always fascinated me, both for its successes and its failures. But despite the many Ultimate books I've covered over the years, there's always been one that I've been hesitant to really discuss on this channel. Now, I love Ultimate Spider-Man. Not only is it one of my favorite comic book series of all time, but this book was also my gateway into the world of all things Spidey, Marvel, and superheroes as a whole. This comic is fantastic, and that's part of the reason why I've always struggled to find the right way to approach talking about it in a video. You see, when I make these videos, I always try to be objective, take my personal bias out of the equation, and analyze a book based on its history, its merits, and its weaknesses. But when it comes to something like Ultimate Spider-Man, it's incredibly difficult for me to separate myself from the story of this comic. My personal experiences of reading this series and how it shaped my love of superheroes are so intertwined with any discussion I could have about the book itself. So instead, I came up with a slightly different idea. In this video, I want to tell you the story about how Ultimate Spider-Man came to be, discuss the history behind this bold new take on Peter Parker, and explain how the series helped to rescue Marvel Comics from misery. But as well, I want to tell you about what this series means to me and how Ultimate Spider-Man helped me fall in love with comic books and superheroes. Before we continue though, just a quick reminder to leave a like on this video if you enjoy it, and subscribe to Owen Likes Comics so you don't miss out on any future videos. While Ultimate Spider-Man was released in the fall of 2000, the basis for this ambitious new series can be traced back several years. You see, while Stan Lee and Steve Ditko had initially told the Wallcrawler's origin back in Amazing Fantasy 15, with this 11-page tale remaining unaltered for decades, by the late 1990s, Marvel began to consider updating the story of Peter Parker's early years. The company initially hired writer-artist John Byrne to tell a new in-continuity origin story, resulting in the 1998 miniseries Spider-Man Chapter 1. While this book did sell relatively well, fans and critics were rather unconvinced by Byrne's retelling of Lee and Ditko's origin, and as such, Marvel were quick to distance themselves from this version of Spidey's early years and restore the classic version to the company's canon. Nevertheless, while Chapter 1 had failed to provide readers with a new and updated origin story for Spider-Man, Marvel was concurrently working on another ambitious project that would soon prove the right opportunity for the web-slinger to be reintroduced. 
At the beginning of 2000, Marvel's newly appointed president Bill Jemis and new editor-in-chief Joe Quesada met to discuss a secret plan called Ground Zero, where the two pitched a complete reset of Marvel's entire comic book universe, wiping the slate clean and starting again in the new millennium. Having only recently emerged from bankruptcy several years earlier, the company was seeking ways to revitalize its sales and repair its brand image, and this shocking pitch quickly became Gemma's and Casada's preferred option. While Jemis led the charge on a wholesale reset for Marvel Comics, Casada, who had found success helming the company's Marvel Knights imprint, instead proposed a slightly different approach, keeping Marvel's 60 plus year history, but starting a brand new secondary universe where writers and artists could freely reinvent their heroes for a new generation. Eventually, Jemis was convinced and the pair soon began searching for a writer to put together a pitch for a new fresh take on an established character's origin, with Spider-Man and X-Men being the two concepts chosen to usher in this new imprint. In the foreword to the first volume of Ultimate Spider-Man, Bill Jemis explains these early ideas for the Ultimate Universe, stating that the Ultimate Marvel comic line will be our most comprehensive, focused, and well-financed imprint. During the next 18 months, the X-Men movie from 20th Century Fox and the Spider-Man movie from Columbia TriStar will raise Marvel exposure and excitement to an all-time high. Marvel plans to leverage the growing demand for our characters into new readership for our comics. Marvel believes that the Ultimate Spider-Man and X-Men lines are the answer. Core comic fans will love these books. The characters are pure and true to themselves. The stories are strong, complete, compelling, and produced by our best artists and writers, but any new reader can pick up any one of these books and start reading. Essentially, the Ultimates swap out the traditional backstory and replace it with a rich, self-contained year 2000 context. Marvel would publicly announce their plans to launch the Ultimate Universe in February of 2000, with the launch title Ultimate Spider-Man Issue 1 set to hit shelves that September. The writer they eventually chose to bring this comic to life was Brian Michael Bendis, an up-and-coming name in the comics industry who Casada had met through artist David Mack. After being introduced to Bendis and familiarizing himself with his independent comics, Jinx and Sam and Twitch, Casada and Jemis allowed the young writer to present his ideas for a Spider-Man reboot, only being asked to follow a series of brief outlines that Jemis had written. These outlines include now major plot lines for the Ultimate Spider-Man series, such as the genetic genetically altered Spider being the product of Oscorp, Norman Osborn and his alter ego the Green Goblin being the web slinger's first ever villain, and extending Lee and Ditko's original 11 page origin to a sprawling 6 issue event. With all of these in mind, Bendis and longtime Spider-Man artist Mark Bagley began developing their bold new take on Peter Parker's formative years. In a letter published in the first volume of Ultimate Spider-Man, Bendis explains the creative process behind the series, noting that Marvel had, to my understanding, been working on this idea in-house for quite some time before I had anything to do with it. What was missing basically was character and style. I was approached to do it based on Bill Jemis reading some of Joe Quesada's copies of my creator-owned comics. They came to me with a clear and really good idea of what the book should be and what it is about. It is a relaunching of Spider-Man as Stan Lee had envisioned him, but written as dramatically and entertainingly as possible as if the events that shaped the young Peter Parker started today. There is nothing we are doing to Spider-Man that isn't in the spirit of the theme and characters that were originally invented. The only thing we are doing is freeing the character from 40 long years of sometimes four Spidey titles a month continuity. Over the spring and summer, Bendis would tweak and flesh out the pitch he received from Jemis, building a modern take on the classic Spider-Man mythos and grounding the hero in the modern world outside his window. The result was a new take on the web slinger that felt both incredibly fresh and highly familiar, with Bendis' writing feeling slick and timely, while Bagley's recognisable and classic Spidey artwork comforted readers as they entered this bold new universe. Anticipation ran high throughout the year 2000 for issue 1 of Ultimate Spider-Man 2 debut, particularly as hype regarding the character's upcoming theatrical film also began to swell. And eventually, on the 7th of September 2000, the very first issue of this exciting new series was released, and both new and long-time readers were met with an origin story truly for the ages.
Issue 1 of Ultimate Spider-Man would introduce us to both this new look take on Peter Parker and the brand new universe in which he inhabits. The comic opens an Oscorp facility where Norman Osborn watches over his scientists experimenting on genetically modified spiders. As Norman discusses the scientists' findings, we see one of the spiders escape from its container. Meanwhile, in Queens, we meet 15-year-old Peter Parker as he's harassed by bullies at high school. As the bullies throw food over Peter, his neighbour Mary Jane Watson watches on sympathetically. As the two teens leave the school, they're confronted by Peter's Uncle Ben. And when returning home, Ben and Aunt May express concern for Peter's well-being. The following day, Peter and his fellow students attend a field trip to Oscorp, where the genetically altered spider that escaped previously bites Peter on the hand. Peter collapses and falls unconscious as one of the bullies squashes the spider. With this, the school trip is cut short and Peter is immediately driven home. Meanwhile, we see Norman Osborn being informed of what has happened and he orders his men to pay Peter's medical bills and keep an eye on the teenager. The next day, Peter returns to school where he's once again targeted by the bullies. However, this time, he instinctively dodges and knocks them out. Realising the spider has somehow affected him, Peter travels home where Hitman attempts to run him over, having been sent by Norman Osborn. But he's able to evade and returns home. Following an argument with Aunt May and Uncle Ben, Peter storms into his bedroom, where he tests the extent of his newfound abilities by hanging upside down from the ceiling. As this occurs, Norman Osborn quizzes his estranged son Harry about Peter, proposing that the two visit his lab the next day. Desperate for his father's affection, Harry agrees and the two friends are given a tour of Oscorp by Dr. Otto Octavius. While the two teenagers explore the facility, Otto secretly takes a blood sample from Peter, who reports its findings back to Norman. Shocked by the results, Norman tells Octavius that he wants to be exposed to the same substance as Peter. Norman's master plan begins soon after, with the CEO being exposed to the Oz formula. However, this experiment goes horribly wrong, with Harry arriving to find the entire lab in ruin, all of the scientists dead and his father gone. As news of Norman's apparent death breaks, Peter begins to use his newfound abilities for money, becoming a professional wrestler under the name The Amazing Spider-Man. Initially, this seems like a lucrative opportunity for Peter, until when walking home one evening, he witnesses a robbery and chooses not to intervene. After returning home though, Peter gets into an argument with Uncle Ben, who is concerned about his nephew's late night outings and sudden change in demeanour. The two have a heated debate, which causes Peter to storm out the house and contemplate everything that has happened on a rooftop, as his internal monologue is intercut with the reveal that Norman Osborn is still alive and has been transformed into a monstrous goblin-like creature. When Peter does eventually return home, he discovers police cars and an ambulance surrounding his house, as a grief-stricken Aunt May reveals that Uncle Ben was killed by an intruder. As the two are being questioned by the police, Peter overhears two police officers saying they've found the culprit's whereabouts, and in a fit of rage, he dons his makeshift costume and enters the night, desperate to hunt him down and exact revenge. Dressed as Spider-Man, Peter does come face to face with his uncle's killer and discovers that it's the same robber he let escape the previous day. Fueled by anger and regret, Peter incapacitates the killer and leaves him with the police, disappearing into the shadows as he remembers Uncle Ben's final words before their argument. With great power comes great responsibility. Over the next few days, we watch Peter reconcile with Mary Jane before returning to school where he's confronted by Harry Osborn. As the two friends bond over their recent losses, the school is suddenly attacked by the Green Goblin. While the students are evacuated, Peter changes into his costume and enters the burning building, coming face to face with his hulking new nemesis. Peter fights the goblin throughout the school, however, he's shocked when the creature mutters his real name. As Norman begins to overpower Peter, the young hero is forced to evade and lure the goblin away from the school, with the two eventually fighting up to a bridge where Norman is shot by a police helicopter helicopter and falls into the river. Presuming that the monster is dead, Peter returns to school where he's met by Harry and MJ, with the former revealing that the goblin was in fact his father and believes he was trying to kill him. 
Harry is taken away by the police as Aunt May arrives and embraces Peter. And as the two return home, Peter wonders whether Harry was right or whether Norman was actually looking for him. Either way, Peter recounts Uncle Ben's final words once more and pledges to honor his fallen father figure by protecting those close and around him, accepting his place as the one and only amazing Spider-Man. While these first seven issues would introduce us both to Bendis and Bagley's new take on Spider-Man and offer up a modernized version of the hero's origin story, the tale of how Ultimate Spider-Man was truly born doesn't end here. Although this first storyline concludes with Peter embracing his newfound responsibilities and becomes a full-fledged superhero, the status quo that would define this series wouldn't truly be formed until the following six issues. You see, following his clash with the Green Goblin, Peter begins to act more regularly as Spider-Man, and as such, he comes into contact with a new array of villains, including the Shocker, Electro, and most notably, Wilson Fisk, the Kingpin. The Kingpin would become one of the main antagonists of the entire Ultimate Spider-Man series, and his long-standing rivalry with the Wallcrawler begins in these five issues. After Peter discovers that Uncle Ben's killer worked for Fisk, Spider-Man begins to focus on taking down organized crime, beginning with the Kingpin's empire. After Fisk sends a group known as the Enforcers to kill Spider-Man, who prove unsuccessful, Peter faces off against his second ever supervillain in the form of Electro. After being hired by the Kingpin, Electro ambushes Peter and knocks him unconscious, delivering him to Fisk and allowing him to unmask the young hero. Realizing Spider-Man is seemingly just a random kid, Kingpin tells his men to dispose of his body while he keeps the mask as a trophy, with Peter eventually waking up, severely injured and now on the run. As this transpires, we see Fisk berate one of his enforcers, Mr. Big, for failing to stop the hero in the first place, brutally murdering him in response as Electro and the other enforcers watch on. Eventually though, Peter is able to break into the Kingpin's headquarters and cut power to the building, leading to another showdown between himself, Electro and the enforcers. Here, a more prepared Spider-Man is able to overcome and defeat the villains before coming face to face with the Kingpin himself, who, despite his immense strength, is knocked unconscious and defeated by Peter. Not only does Spider-Man finally defeat the Kingpin though, but he also obtains the security footage from the villain's cameras, erasing any trace of him being unmasked, while also taking the proof that he was responsible for the death of Mr. Big. This footage is anonymously delivered to the Daily Bugle, and once the story breaks, Fisk is forced to flee the country entirely to avoid arrest. However, this second volume of Ultimate Spider-Man isn't just noteworthy for its expansion of the hero's rogues gallery, but also in how it progresses the personal and human aspect of Peter Parker and his stories. In addition to Peter beginning to work at the Daily Bugle, initially going to sell photographs before being hired as a web developer, throughout this storyline, we see him and Mary Jane Watson continue to grow closer. However, Peter's encounters with the Kingpin and Electro put a considerable strain on their blossoming relationship, as he's forced to miss several of their dates and doesn't respond to her calls. After defeating the villains though, Peter returns home and is immediately confronted by MJ, who lambasts Peter for seemingly ignoring her. Struggling to explain himself, Peter is faced with no other choice but to reveal the truth, telling her that he is Spider-Man. At first, MJ doesn't seem to believe him until Peter leaps onto the wall and sticks there. Shocked and mentally connecting the dots, Mary Jane promises to protect Peter's secrets and the two embrace and profess their true feelings for one another. And with this, all of the core tenets of the Spider-Man mythos had now been established, albeit with a unique and modern twist. By the time issue 14 hit shelves in December of 2001, this fresh reimagining of the hero had become largely fully formed, with many of Spider-Man's biggest foes and supporting characters now introduced, as well as the personal relationships that would come to define this long-running series. The final two pieces of this puzzle would actually debut in issue 14, in the form of Gwen Stacy and the return of Otto Octavius, now adopting the identity of the villainous Doctor Octopus. And with this, the first chapter of Ultimate Spider-Man came to a dramatic close, as the Wallcrawler's origin story concluded and a bold new future began for both Spider-Man and this brand new Marvel Universe.
After the conclusion of this initial 13 issue arc, Bendis and Bagley's Ultimate Spider-Man comic would go from strength to strength, cementing itself over the next several years as one of the best series of the new millennium and a near definitive take on the story of Peter Parker. Having established the world of this new Ultimate Universe, Bendis would spend the next few years introducing a wide range of new heroes, villains and supporting characters into it. In addition to also co-writing the Ultimate Fantastic Four title with Mark Miller, Bendis would use the pages of Ultimate Spider-Man to introduce antagonists like Venom, Mysterio and the Sinister Six, whilst the likes of Black Cat, Daredevil and Moon Knight would all be introduced as new allies for Spider-Man. In addition to this, Bendis would also have Peter cross over with several of Marvel's other fledgling Ultimate titles, briefly dating Kitty Pride and teaming up with the X-Men, and even fighting alongside the Ultimates this universe's version of the Avengers in the seven-part crossover series Ultimate Six. Over the next decade, Ultimate Spider-Man would become a staple of the comic book industry, regularly being one of Marvel's best-selling titles, as well as the perfect gateway for new fans to engage with the stories of the web-slinger, especially after the release of the 2002 Spider-Man film. While the Ultimate Comics universe did begin to decline in the late 2000s as a result of the backlash towards books like Ultimates 3 and Ultimatum, Bendis and Bagley's Ultimate Spider-Man remained popular and well received. Even as the world around it was crumbling down, this comic was still a firm fixture on many people's pull lists for several years, remaining a safe haven for fans of all ages and an exciting take on Spider-Man that both new and old readers could appreciate. However, all great things do eventually come to an end. After collaborating with Brian Michael Bendis for 110 issues, artist Mark Bagley made the decision to leave Ultimate Spider-Man. Although Bendis continued to write the series with new artists such as Stuart Immerman, David LaFuente and Sarah Pacelli, the book did eventually come to its conclusion in June of 2011, with the final issue, Ultimate Spider-Man issue 160, seeing Peter Parker heroically give his life to defeat the Green Goblin, dying in Aunt May's arms as he's finally recognised as the world's greatest superhero. However, even though Peter's death marked the true end of this era, it wasn't actually the end for Ultimate Spider-Man, with Bendis and Pacelli later relaunching the title with a brand new protagonist in Miles Morales, who took over the mantle of Spider-Man in the aftermath of Peter's death. Miles would carry on the legacy of Spider-Man until the Ultimate Universe's demise in 2015, when it was destroyed in the lead up to Marvel's Secret Wars event. And although the Ultimate Spider-Man title would run for close to 12 years, I believe it's in this first year of storytelling where the book's impact and significance is best felt. You see, Ultimate Spider-Man isn't just one of the greatest comics in modern history, but it's a book that has a deep personal connection to me. As I mentioned in the intro, the first volume of this series was the very first comic that I ever really got into. I'm not sure exactly if it was the first comic that I ever read, but it's definitely the first series that I properly became invested in and read every subsequent issue afterwards. In a lot of ways, this book took my existing love of Spider-Man from the cartoons and amplified it tenfold, not only giving me the same larger-than-life action that I was used to, but combining it with heartfelt character studies and a protagonist that I could absolutely relate to. And as I grew up, this book stayed with me. Once I ventured into adolescence, I began to see a lot of myself in Peter Parker. He was dealing with many of the same problems that I was facing, all while simultaneously carrying the responsibility of being a superhero. And while it wasn't easy for him either, he always managed to overcome those problems. So if Peter could, why couldn't I? This book taught me a lot about Spider-Man. It introduced me to many characters who were instrumental to the hero's lore and mythos, as well as showcasing many other Marvel heroes I wasn't yet familiar with most notably the Avengers. I remember when Ultimate Six happened and thinking it was just the biggest, coolest thing ever. My personal favorite hero, Spider-Man, now thrust into this cinematic epic event where he teams up with these other amazing superheroes to stop a group of his most dangerous foes. But even more importantly than that, Ultimate Spider-Man was always there for me when I needed it most. When things were tough or whenever I felt lost, these stories were always an oasis, a safe space for me to go to and escape to a world where even the most difficult problems could be solved by Spidey's courage and inability to ever give up. 
This series not only taught me to never give up, despite the curveballs and obstacles that life may throw at you, but it also taught me to embrace who I am and not be ashamed of any of the differences that set me apart from anyone else. That although times may be tough and things may seem like they're the end of the world, we can always find a way to withstand and persevere, and if we can, then everything will be okay. Going back and rereading the first two volumes of Ultimate Spider-Man for this video, there were a lot of things that I found particularly interesting. Sure, the overtly stylized year 2000 look and feel of the book may have significantly dated it, as well as many of the pop culture references that Bendis loved to throw in, but at its core, these 13 issues represent Spider-Man at his most earnest. A young boy, lost and unsure of his place in the world, being given immense power and suddenly having to grapple with the responsibility that comes with it. His friends and his family all experience danger, sometimes as a result of Peter's newfound abilities, and yet, when he's forced to step up and fully become Spider-Man, he always finds a way to save the day and protect those closest to him. Despite how Bendis expanded on Lee and Ditko's classic origin story, turning it into a full six-issue saga, this added content, in my opinion, allows us to feel at home in this new world that the writer crafted, and properly connect with Peter Parker as a person long before he even becomes Spider-Man. In my opinion, these two first volumes are absolutely brilliant. I think they do such a tremendous job at introducing not just the characters and themes of Ultimate Spider-Man, but the entire world of the Ultimate Comics universe, setting in motion a place for writers and artists to experiment and tell unique stories in for over a decade. But in addition to this, revisiting these comics brought back so many personal memories and reminded me of where I've come from and how much this series has helped shape the person that I am now. Those early issues of Ultimate Spider-Man aren't just an origin story for Peter Parker, but in a way, they're also kind of an origin story for me too, as this was the series that fully immersed me into the world of comics and gave me the confidence to dive in head first and explore many other titles and characters. I don't think it's hyperbole for me to say that, had I not picked up a random issue of this series some 20 years ago in a newsagent's, it's unlikely that I'd even be sat here today, making videos on this channel. And for that, I'm truly grateful, and I believe it's necessary to celebrate Ultimate Spider-Man for not only being an incredible origin story and a tremendous reinvention of Marvel's flagship hero, but for being a book that helped me fall in love with the entire medium of comics. And in a lot of ways, Ultimate Spider-Man really has changed my life for the better. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a like on this video and leave a comment down below as well. Let me know your thoughts on everything we talked about in today's video. I can't wait to hear what you have to say as always. If you're new to Owen Likes Comics, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notify bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. And if you enjoyed this and you want some more, there should be some other videos on screen right now that you might also enjoy. If you want to help support the channel and help me make more videos, you can do so over at patreon.com slash owenlikescomics. Or if you want some more of me, you can follow me on Twitter just at owenlikescomics. But that's all for this video though. Again, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and hopefully I'll see you next time. But until then, take care and keep reading.